Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, come along and speak to this group uh, today. Um, I do have a bit of stuff to cover, so I'm going to try to run through it as quickly as I can. Um, and as Wayne said, it's particularly neat for me to uh, come along and uh, speak to this group because I spent a bit of time here at Victoria myself, done a bit of study, uh, and I have a lot of fond uh, memories of this place uh, personally as well. So what I'm going to present to you today uh, is essentially a, a reworked vis- ver- uh, uh, version of presentations that I was invited to give to the Ministry for the Environment uh, and also the Ministry for Primary Industries. And it's based on uh, uh, PhD research, as, as Wayne uh, alluded to, uh, in environmental science that I completed through the University of Auckland uh, just over a bit over a year ago now. And just from the outset, I'd, I'd really like to acknowledge the uh, scholarship funding that I uh, received for that, for that research uh, from the University of Auckland and also uh, from my employer at the time, which was Boffin Miskell. Um, what my thesis essentially did was it looked at uh, how we currently understand introduced wildlife in New Zealand, uh, thought a, bit, a little bit about how our uh, understandings uh, about many of these species have developed over time, how they were in the past, and thought a little bit more about how those uh, understandings may come to change in future as well. And a big part of my research was fundamentally asking whether we might take a, a more accepting or a more conciliatory uh, approach Uh, to many of our introduced species, and and even in some cases to some species that we might currently consider to be uh, pests. Um, You know, something that international visitors often remark on when they come to New Zealand uh, is is New Zealanders' intense uh, love uh, for many of our introduced species, uh, and particularly uh, our bird life. Um, But something that they also remark on is New Zealanders' uh, intense hatred and loathing uh, for many uh, species that we've introduced, and especially uh, any species that contradict uh, the interests of our our bird life. Uh, So it's something that comes through very clearly for me in the conservation uh, literature um, in comparison to elsewhere. Uh, We tend to have um, uh, quite an extreme uh, attitude towards, towards this sort of stuff. We tend to take it very, very seriously. Uh, and that attitude is supported um, by, a, by a very polarised construction of nature itself, uh, which tends to um, present these, these two things of native uh, and introduced in, in quite a, as I say, a polarised uh, way. Uh, and this um, uh, way of framing uh, our environment uh, can make it difficult uh, and, dare I say, it, often uh, controversial uh, for people to express uh, views that are compassionate, that are... Uh, that are positive and that are even respectful for many of our uh, introduced species. What I can say is that having uh, studied and worked uh, in the environmental uh, sector and the industry for, uh, for some years now, uh, it's very difficult to have conversations about conservation uh, in New Zealand. It's at least those that sit outside of, of the norm. And it's actually something that I think we have a, a, a real problem uh, with in this country uh, and that I'm going to speak about uh, a little bit more uh, in just a minute. So just to get us started, I just want to start off with, you know, how did, how did I get here? Uh, and by that, I, you know, I don't mean did I take the bus or did I take a cab or whatever. I mean more in terms of my, uh, my career progression, uh, how I got to be sort of standing in front of you um, talking um, today. And probably the place to, to start would be uh, back in 1998 uh, when I began my, uh, my bachelor's studies uh, here, at, here at Vic. Um, I did a Bachelor of Science um, in Biology. Uh, and I also did a, did a commerce degree, I did the, the conjoint thing. Uh, some of you will be doing something similar. Uh, I then took a, took a year off, uh, taught English in, in South Korea. Uh, I'd had a bit of a gap year and took some time off. Um, I came back to Victoria and I did a Master's of Science uh, in Ecology and Biodiversity. Uh, and the, the sort of thesis component I did uh, uh, under Casey Burns, which many of you will, uh, will have had as a, as a lecturer and some of you may have a sup- as a supervisor. Um, I did a, a wide range of part-time work throughout my studies, both my, my bachelor's and particularly my master's, uh, working at places like the QE2 National Trust, uh, industry places like Seafood New Zealand, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry, other sort of government uh, sort of roles. And in the final year of my master's, I began working for Boffer Miskell, uh, which is an environmental design consultancy, uh, first doing bird surveys for what's now become um, the Markra Wind Farm out there on the out there on the west coast. And once I'd finished my master's, I travelled up then to Auckland, and then I spent about six and a half, six and a half years working as an ecologist for Boffer Muskell, uh, mostly doing ecological impact assessment work, uh, working on big projects, wind farms, uh, roads, property development, uh, and other things like that. So one thing that really struck me while doing uh, this kind of work, and, and that still strikes me to this day, 
uh, is the basis that we use for valuing uh, wildlife the way that we do in New Zealand. Uh, you know, with impact assessment work, sometimes you work in pristine uh, environments and re- relatively untouched areas, but more often than not, uh, you're working in uh, ecosystems that are a little uh, more rougher around the edges, it's fair to say. And often you're working in urban or peri-urban environments, uh, and the ecosystems are, are a real mix there, generally of, of native and introduced, uh, a lot of common native species, and your fair share of uh, pests and weeds as well. And the uh, scheme of valuation that we work under in New Zealand uh, is basically this, and this is an extremely simplified version of it. At the top of the pyramid uh, is your your threatened or at-risk native species or or ecosystems. And these things uh, you cannot cannot put a bulldozer through. Uh, These things you're going to need to avoid or you're going to need to offer up some sort of mitigation for if you're going to uh, damage or modify them. Next, and it's um, some way down, uh, quite some way down the pyramid from there, uh, your common native uh, species. And these are things that uh, you probably actually are going to be able to put the bulldozer through, uh, so long as you can show that they're definitely common, you know, that there's plenty of them around. Basically, the more successful they are, the less they're considered worth protecting in New Zealand. Next, in some very, very considerable way further down, uh, there's your introduced species. And these ones are generally considered to have no particular value or, or in terms of biodiversity value in New Zealand, so long as they're not uh, game species. Uh, so no real problem putting the bulldozer through those ones either. And finally, you have your weed and pest species, which, as you'll be well aware, uh, you're essentially incentivised to destroy. So it's a scheme of valuation overall that ensures that under most circumstances it's going to be pretty easy, actually, to put the bulldozer through it. Occasionally you'll find some threatened or at-risk uh, species or ecosystem, but really by their very nature being rare and uncommon, you don't tend to run into them too often. And in many respects, uh, for me, it's a very perverse system, uh, leading to exactly the kinds of biodiversity outcomes um, that you would expect. And what also increasingly uh, bugged me, and, and, and what still bugs me, uh, is that many ecosystems that will happily bulldoze, our novel mixed hybrid ecosystems, are those that make up most of our ecosystems in New Zealand. What's worse, uh, these are some of the most diverse, vibrant and dynamic systems that we have in this country. Despite the contributions of disciplines like urban and landscape ecology over many years now, we're still really conditioned as ecologists to be looking for the the native and the pristine all the time. When for me it's it's really the mongrel, bastard, mixed up ecosystems that are often uh, some of the most interesting out there. And I thought and I still think that we don't have a strong basis sometimes for being so dismissive of many of these novel ecosystems and many of the species that sit within within them and the values that they support as well. So anyway, some of these thoughts later became uh, the seeds of of, of my PhD thesis uh, and my research in that that area. Um, And just briefly to complete the the career uh, history, in the last six months of my PhD, uh, I travelled back down uh, here to Wellington to take up a role uh, with Greater Wellington uh, and I now work as a senior advisor in their uh, biodiversity department. So I'm working more on the pl- uh, policy and planning aspects of biodiversity management now. I've sort of moved a little bit out of the more technical space. But anyway, to, to return to my research, uh, I went into the PhD really thinking, uh, as many PhDs do in their early stages, you know, that I had some pretty groundbreaking ideas to share, pretty earth-shattering ideals, ideas that I was going to build on. Um, I thought uh, that I was going to be maybe the next Darwin or something, um, you know, really special like that. So it was um, with more than a little bit of horror uh, that I came to realise really in the first two to three months uh, of my studies when I was doing the literature review uh, stage and doing a lot of reading that I wasn't nearly uh, as original as as I thought that I was. Uh, And in fact what I found was that many others uh, in the literature and a whole range of literatures were also also having uh, these sort of semi-heretical thoughts uh, about ecology and about nature, uh, many of them many, many years before, before I had. So what I found was that there were a whole range of literatures, not just in ecology uh, and elsewhere in the, in the natural sciences, but also in the social sciences and the humanities and the arts, across geography, environmental history, philosophy, sociology, you, know, you name it, people were talking about how we think about nature, and they were thinking quite a lot about how introduced species uh, fits into our ideas about nature. I was actually a bit daunted to find that there'd been this explosion of nature-related discussion and research over the last couple of decades, uh, and many of these people were just as sceptical uh, about the validity of many of the ways that we currently think about uh, nature as I was. So some of the papers that I shared with you, a couple of them that I shared with you, one by Charles Warren, another one by Mark Sagoff, for example, uh, are about trying to um, 
open up your mind a little bit to some of these different literatures that are going on. Uh, the, the papers that I shared were across um, geography, uh, environmental history and philosophy. Um, so what really struck me uh, learning this stuff was this enormous difference as well between what people understood in the literature, and that, it, that had changed quite a lot in the last 20 years, and what people think in the public, and even what people think uh, out there in industry as well. And the question that I, that I asked myself is, why didn't, we, why didn't I already know all of this stuff that had been written? And I thought about that a little bit more, and I thought about the disjunct uh, in information and understanding in the space. And I, I came to the conclusion that a lot of it comes down uh, to the, the means of disseminating the information. Um, you know, I was reading all of stu- all of the stuff as you would at PhD level and uh, journal articles. And uh, the problem uh, with that is that in the main, uh, most people, uh, in fact, don't read journal articles. In fact, just to give you some numbers, you know, uh, the the total number of peer-reviewed journal articles being produced every year now is about uh, 1.5 million. Uh, that's every year across something like 26,000 journals. The fact of the matter is that your average journal is likely to be read in its entirety uh, by no more than about 10 people. And if you go through those 10 people, you know, there's yourself, there's your, there's your supervisor, there's your, your two editors, there's your mum and your dad, there's your girlfriend, um, you know, maybe your boyfriend as well. Uh, and then, and then uh, you know, there's a couple of people who are, who are going to read your, your average paper. Some papers are going to do much better than that, of course, but that's just talking about your average. Uh, fully half of journal articles are read only by their authors and editors. Uh, a third are never cited by anyone. And the really crucial thing is that most practitioners working in the field do not read uh, journal articles. You know, I have a, a pile of journal articles sitting on my desk. People think I'm extremely smart. My, my, my pile gets bigger and bigger and bigger every year. The reason for that is I never read them. I never get any time to. I read, a, read occasional uh, ones, but, but very infrequently. So uh, what, what I, I suppose I've been doing uh, since, uh, since finishing my PhD uh, is uh, trying to move out of the, of the academic sort of realm a little bit, although also dabbling a bit in that, trying to get more into, the, uh, into popular writing, uh, mostly because I think that the biggest uh, and most important task really now is to try to educate people a little bit about some of the, the changes that have gone on in the literature in the last few decades. Um, and in general, in my view, uh, most practitioners working in the field are theoretically probably about 20, 20 to 30 years out of date and behind the literature. And I think that there has some, this has some really serious consequences for how we're continually managing and thinking about our ecosystems. So further to that, and um, you know, I've, I've been quite busy over the last uh, year or so uh, trying to, uh, in the very limited time that I actually have, write a few articles here and there uh, for newspapers and magazines. Uh, one of which happened to be, I was very lucky to, to have been read by um, the Radio New Zealand uh, reporter Kim Hill, um, who then invited me onto her show in the latter part of the year, uh, for the latter part of year, last year, uh, for a chat. Um, and it turned out to be a really uh, fruit, fruitful experience, and you can still download that uh, talk um, today. Generated a, a whole ton of feedback, just uh, tons and tons of, uh, of uh, responses uh, during and after the interview. And a whole lot of really useful connections for me were made afterwards as well. And I just want to uh, share some of that public feedback from that interview now as a sort of lead-in uh, to what I want to talk to you uh, about further today. So here's some, some of the nice things that people said uh, during the, the conversation with Kim Hill. Uh, one of the most common themes that people uh, expressed was that they found that the conversation was, was refreshing, that it was good to have someone talking outside of the norm uh, in conservation. And here's some of the, the not-so-nice ones. Uh, people often thought that it was poor form uh, to show any kind of support uh, for many species of introduced wildlife, uh, and they were often quite defensive of, uh, of their biodiversity. And for many people, um, there's some cool ones out there, um, their biodiversity was often taken to be um, native uh, biodiversity almost exclusively. Um, and the last quote there uh, is probably uh, the most sim- uh, uh, symptomatic, um, I suppose, of the various... Uh, phobias and anxieties people have about introduced species uh, uh, in New Zealand. So that they want to pull the lever uh, and drop this guy down the chute, let him feed the Norwegian rats in the pit. Uh, so, you know, we have some real um, poets out there in the community. Um, but again, it just underlines the difficulties uh, we can have with having conversations in this space. A lot of people are very afraid uh, that, uh, at the prospect that our views uh, in this space may change over the coming decades. Here's a few more of the same. Uh, these ones are mostly directed at, at the poor old possum. Um, 
Honestly, if you want to provoke a New Zealander, uh, tell them that you, know, that you love a possum or even that you're indifferent towards possums. Uh, it tends to elicit the most visceral and unfortunately often xenophobic responses, even uh, from usually quite measured people. So these sorts of furious, um, I would say at times quasi-religious passions for conservation often characterise our discussions about nature in New Zealand. And a lot of them really do, uh, in my experience, emanate from the top down, whether it be from academics, from politicians, and from many senior managers as well. And so, as I've already re- uh, mentioned, it makes it very difficult to have uh, conversations about conservation in New Zealand. New Zealanders in general tend to have this very with us or or against us attitude when it comes to conservation. You either agree that this is the right way to do it or you're my enemy and there's very little room in between. Predator Free New Zealand, uh, the government's endorsement of it recently is a good example of that. For a lot of people, you know, you're either really ambitious and you're imaginative and you've got these great ideas about Predator Free and it's going to be this wonderful thing. Or you're a denier, you're a dissenter, you're a contrarian, you're a loser uh, if you want to raise any kind of objections. It's deeply concerning to me that the most frequent comment uh, that I got from my my positive feedback on that Camille interview, aside from refreshing, was that people thought that I was brave. They thought that I was courageous, even. And while it's very uh, flattering to hear those kinds of things, um, what they're essentially saying is that you'd need to be brave to talk about our basic assumptions and objectives for conservation in New Zealand, even when doing so, as I was, through the most uh, orthodox objectives Uh, channels possible, in this case through PhD research. And to me that really demonstrates how unbalanced we've got in New Zealand, how far in some respects from the bounds of reasonable and considered conversation we've strayed. People in the industry in particular are afraid that they will lose funding or even their employment if they offer different views on conservation. And I think that many of them are very well justified uh, in their fears. It's a real problem we have in this country. It's a real sacred cow, uh, and it's something that I think that we need to be talking about more, uh, both as an industry and as a society. So what I'd like to do now uh, is I'd like to offer up ten different um, beliefs, if you will, assumptions, understandings, whatever you want to talk about, whatever you want to consider them to be, about conservation uh, in New Zealand and as discussion points uh, moving forward and provide you with some, um, some thoughts on each of those. And again, I'll just reiterate that this isn't a summary of my, of my PhD research. I wouldn't uh, draw you, want to draw you through that, um, though of course it does draw on it to some extent. I'm going to be um, pretty superficial with my treatment of each of these different things, knowing that I'm not going to be able to give any of them mu- much justice. They're all going to be set up as uh, straw men, if you like. But in many respects, many respects, I see that as a good thing, uh, because it then gives us the freedom after this presentation and, um, and, and, and uh, uh, moving forward, I suppose, that... You know that you can offer different thoughts on this sort of stuff, and and try to promote uh, a little bit more banter in general. Um, and I don't know, maybe I'm wrong about some of these things. I'm not saying that there's necessarily one right way to think about this stuff. But what I would say is that if I'm if I'm right, or at least I'm in the ballpark with at least one or two of these things, um, then it might uh, mean that we should give a little bit more of these conversations uh, some more time and space. Okay, so the first one is this idea that they don't belong, um, with they, of course, being interpreted as uh, many of our introduced species. And a couple of quotes uh, just brought up here uh, from that feedback to the Kim Hill interview. Uh, The first one there uh, from someone, we should round up all possums that have eaten more than a certain amount of native vegetation on an offshore island and then send them back to Australia. So this person somewhat ironically suggesting that we treat possums in the same way that Australians treat their asylum seekers. And really, the second one there, um, also interesting, the creator set everything in its place for the good of mankind. Why are we so arrogant to think that we're greater than he, to disregard his will? And that second quote replicates the essence almost exactly uh, of an article that appeared in the Auckland Star newspaper, a historical newspaper, uh, back in 1893. And to quote uh, from that article... We have all our own places in creation, and we are only safe when we are keeping them. It is so with men, it is so with animals. That article was accompanied by an illustration that you can see on on your right there uh, uh, of a workbench with each of the the tools neatly slotted away in their respective compartments. Your hammer goes here, your wrench goes there, your nails go there. Don't mix up the things and make sure that they always go back in their place. The title of that article, incidentally, was A Place for Everything and Everything in Its Place, which, which was and still is a popular aphorism dating from the 17th century. That aphorism and the thinking behind it was especially common during the Victorian era, 
era and was a matter of fact for most colonial New Zealanders. It very neatly portrayed the cultural notion that things have a place where they belong and to which they should ideally uh, be returned when they're no longer in use. And it wasn't just uh, animals that had their place uh, at this time, of course. Women also most notoriously had their place. And this was uh, very neatly summarised uh, by the Whanganui Herald here in an article around the same uh, time. That article was, it was entitled How to Educate a Wife. And that, uh, that article uh, said that, that that place was in the kitchen, of course, where they might enjoy the art of wholesome and appetising cookery. The place of human races or ethnicities was also widely known. Chinese people at the time belonged to China, Indians in India, Mexicans in Mexico, and so on and so forth. Funnily enough, there was always a lot more ambivalence, though, about where Europeans belonged. Now, as we all know, over the course of the 20th century, the supposed natural place of many of these things has been challenged. And as a result, the idea that women and races and ethnicities have natural roles or places uh, has really been comprehensively discredited. As we, as we see now, these sorts of ideas are, are come across as laughable or ridiculous. It's interesting, then, that in the context of wildlife, the notion that everything has its place where it belongs still retains uh, enormous currency. This came across to me very strongly uh, in the interviews for my PhD. In fact, almost every interviewee I, uh, of mine, and, I, and I, I sampled right across the, in the industry, expressed some version of this belief. Here's a sample of some of them. Uh, everything, everything has its natural place, I think, in the natural world, uh, and it's only whether they fit into that environment that's the question. Another person, the role of humans is to judge ones that fit and ones that don't. Uh, and the last one there, we can put bits of the jigsaw back in to make a hole. And the illustration on the, on, that you can see there on the, on the right is taken from a recent issue of the Forest and Bird magazine. Uh, it depicts a native forest puzzle with each of the pieces, or the native species in this case, fitting neatly back in together to make a hole. Now this notion that everything has its place where it belongs uh, would have gone down very, very well uh, still in the 1950s and the 1960s. It wouldn't have been out of place in the dialogue of a Mad Men episode, but it strikes me in the year 2017 as being awkward, uh, if not embarrassing. It's also deeply hypocritical. Uh, my ancestors, for example, uh, come from England, they come from Cornwall, actually. Um, you know, does that mean that my natural place is in Cornwall, that that's uh, where I belong uh, in the world? Uh, for, for me, you know, clearly not. It's, uh, I'd say that's ridiculous, and most people would, would probably agree with them, with some exceptions. Um, it's interesting, then, that we won't take it when it's applied to ourselves, but we're very, very happy to dish it out to other species. The second one, uh, natives define us, this idea that uh, uh, New Zealand's national identity, uh, at least when it comes to wildlife, is defined mainly by our native species. And sure, we'll accept uh, cows and kiwi fruit and so on and so forth and farmed and horticultural settings. But with the notable exception of introduced spe uh, game species, which is another story again, we don't generally have much time for, our non -native, for the non-native in our wildlife, and certainly not um, in the conservation estate. But what I would venture is that that way of framing our identity uh, is very much a, a current choice that we're choosing to make. It's not a fact. And it's a choice that we can change uh, over time as well, remembering that in the mid-1800s, New Zealand's uh, colonial uh, people defined themselves largely by introduced species. At that time, they saw introduced species as defining their sense of national identity and natives, essentially, as foreigners. So our views since, uh, since that time have basically reversed. They've gone from one extreme, really, to the other, with a little pause for thought or consideration in the, in the interim. It's clear we often seem to use wildlife as props for expressing our visions of a puristic national identity. And that uh, identity is currently defined not only by the presence of native species, but also uh, by the absence of, of many uh, ostensibly foreign species of wildlife. One of my, uh, as one of my uh, interviews in informed me here, again, another quote, uh, the best conservationists in New Zealand are the best murderers, essentially. That's the guts of it. And the more mustelids or rats or whatever it might be that you can kill, the more effective you're going to be uh, at your job. And that was, a, that was a former staff member at the Department of Conservation, someone that's still very uh, committed to, to conservation in New Zealand. A lot of people see their role uh, in New Zealand as compassionate killers, removing the species that don't belong and supporting those that do. And for a lot of people, killing pests is, uh, is, it really is a, 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 an important part of expressing their national identity and connecting with, with the local culture. 
as uh, anthropologist Nicholas Smith reflected recently when considering Australia, uh, 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 conservation in Australia, he said that for many conservationists, getting rid of feral biota and reintroducing native ones is a way of making the country and themselves more Australian. I think that holds even more so for, for, for us here in New Zealand. But what I would suggest, uh, and opposite I suppose, uh, is that our wildlife doesn't have to be defined uh, entirely by, by our native species. That's again a choice that we're currently making. In many other countries, introduced species come to be regarded as important facets of their wildlife and, and to their sense of national and local identity as well. In many European countries, for example, introduced species are highly treasured uh, features of their wild biota. It's also important to note that uh, identities are not just defined by, by things. They're also defined by processes and influence as well. A recent survey of people in the Mediterranean islands, for example, found that people there considered the local environment to be characterised uh, in many ways by sustained anthropomorphic change. As the authors of the, the study summarised, many people thought that the environment of the Mediterranean islands uh, should be allowed to continue to evolve within the changing cultural landscapes as they had for millennia. These sorts of sentiments are expressed not just in the old world but also um, in the new world as well. Uh, as a quote from Central American ecologist Ariel Lugo, uh, who has said to find it difficult to despise invasive trees, as he thinks many of these colleagues does, and even embraces that change. And he's quoted as, as saying there, my parents and their parents saw one Puerto Rico, and I'm going to see another Puerto Rico, and my children will see another. So that sense of, uh, of change and dyna dynamism in the ecosystem is really reflected there. Taking a few of these sorts of th uh, threads in mind, I think there's scope uh, at least uh, for here in New Zealand, to start to think a little bit more holistically and perhaps a little more inclusively about our sense of national identity and how many of our wild introduced species often contribute to that identity uh, alongside their native counterparts. All right, so number three um, is this idea that it's a war. Uh, you know, we often frame uh, our relationship with introduced species in New Zealand in this way, that it's a, that's a war, it's a battle, it's a fight. And there's plenty of examples of it, uh, and most recently in the Department of Conservation's war on weeds uh, and our battle for our birds. And you know, war metaphors feature prominently in both popular and scientific literatures in New Zealand. These metaphors set up the notion that introduced species are fighting against us and deliberately uh, attempting to contradict our interests. They also construct the idea that native species are in an alliance with us, which is rather curiously the opposite construction to that of colonial New Zealanders. Personally, I've got a lot of, a lot of problems with the use of uh, war metaphors in relation to wildlife. Uh, some of those have been summed up recently, uh, well, actually it was a couple of years ago now, by, by Brendan Larson in one of those papers that I circulated around this group. I'll touch on some of those and sort of expand on them just briefly as well. Uh, the first one for me is that it's just, it's just inaccurate. War is incorrect because, of course, these species are not remotely conscious of our militant uh, intentions, and nor, nor can they be capable uh, of understanding them. So while we often talk about battling or fighting uh, these species, I'd suggest that a more accurate way to frame the engagement would be to use words like slaughter uh, or massacre. And while I appreciate that that, that, that might feel very deflating for, for conservationists, and, and it can make it... Um, you know, difficult, um, and, and in terms of you know presenting ourselves as the sort of heroic parties in the equation, I, I do think that it's important, uh, particularly as scientists, to be using the most accurate terminology to frame what we're actually doing here. You know, let's not try to dress this up as something that it's not, regardless of how well-meaning we may often be. Second one is that war as a framing is, is unethical. Wars themselves almost always promote injustice uh, and collateral damage. We only need to look at what's going on in Syria at the moment to see what generally happens during uh, times of war. As the old quote goes, in, the, in times of war, the laws fall silent. So wars are hardly something for us to aspire to. Let's also reflect that we have important responsibilities towards animal welfare under the Animal Welfare Act, the Wildlife Act, and a range of other legislation and national direction. A framing of war is not going to lead us down the path of good out outcomes for animal welfare. In fact, it's quite the opposite. And um, by the way, just as an aside, uh, the minister here seems very fond of, of this photo with herself and, and, and a takahe. Uh, but I've, I've always found it a bit of a strange photo because it does very much look like she's trying to strangle that poor bird. Um, and I'll, I'll come to that um, again uh, later on. 
Third, the frame of war prevents people from questioning our current management practices. It prevents intelligent and reasonable conversation. Anyone who questions a war is, of course, unpatriotic or even heretical. And to me and many others writing in the literature, this is an extremely unproductive outcome. Trying to shut down dissent and critical analysis, which is what the war framing does, is fundamentally anti-science. And lastly, war is just a, it's just a failed strategy, I'm afraid. After over a century of warfare, or of framing wars with our wildlife in, in this way, we've actually eradicated very little in this country. With the exception of some localised biosecurity operatives, most of our target species have actually expanded their populations over this time, including some of the ones we've spent the most money and time on trying to control. We've had some successes. Sure enough, we have. We've won some battles, if you will. For example, we've eradicated mammals from some offshore islands. Um, but even these need to be placed in perspective. You know, mammal eradications from islands in New Zealand amount to about 0.2% of our land mass. It's not, we're not talking big numbers here. If our goal was to beat the enemy, then I'd put it to you that we've largely uh, lost. Let's just admit that. Some would say quite comprehensively, in fact. And given this, maybe it might be sensible to start thinking about whether different approaches might yield uh, better outcomes in future. OK, number four uh, is this idea, uh, which is ongoing, that we need to restore uh, balance, that we've upset the, the balance or equilibrium of nature, um, but that we can return to it uh, in future if, if appropriate steps are taken. This belief is very much supported in New Zealand uh, by this notion that our environment is Gondwan in, in character, uh, that it hasn't changed ma much in the last 80 million years, or if it has changed, it's changed only very slowly and incrementally. This notion of balance came through again extremely strongly during my PhD research and was commonly reflected in people's attitudes towards introduced species. And that's a little surprising, of course, because the idea of balance or equilibrium fell out of favour in the ecological liter literature as early as the 1970s and the 1980s. Yet it remains extremely popular, both amongst the public and even still among many scientists. Uh, and that's partly because the myth that there is a balance of nature is part of most cosmologies and it's central to a lot of religious beliefs. The idea of balance also imagines this orderly, predictable little world that we can control and that we can manipulate if we can only get our hands on this ever-elusive instruction manual. So it provides that, uh, that means that we can use nature for our, for our ends. So exploring this notion of ecological balance, uh, biogeographer Stephen Trudgell recently wrote, uh, and I quote here, the balance of nature is untenable when faced with evidence, but the idea is a strong article of faith. In Western society, we readily reach for an Edenic myth of humans causing disharmony in the natural order of things. We shoulder the guilt-laden notion that we've disturbed the natural order, and it's now all wrong, it's all our fault. This becomes very much a situating narrative and a personal motivation. In contrast, the consolidating flux of nature, or disequil disequilibrium paradigm, emphasises that most ecosystems are actually characterised by un uh, unpredictability, dynamism and constant change. As American ecologist Mark Davis recently put it, and by the way this is the author of the textbook on invasion biology, the natural world is more like a swirling and boiling cauldron than an integrated superorganism. Our environments in New Zealand really epitomise that, um, perhaps more, than, more so than many other places in the world, being characterised really on so many levels um, by constant change and reassembly. New Zealand, for example, is one of the most geologically active countries in the world, constantly disrupted and provoked by eruptions and earthquakes, uh, most recently uh, by the Hattabi eruption in 180 AD, which famously turned the sky red over Rome and would have literally obliterated life over large swathes of the North Island. New Zealand's also experienced a prolonged freeze and thaw events at the last glacial maximum, around, uh, which was around 20,000 years ago, sea levels were about 120 metres lower than they are today. And this is significant because it means that most of the lowland ecosystems that we have in this country have formed uh, actually in relatively recent times. And because ecosystems don't tend to migrate as intact units, it, re it reminds us that many of the systems that we're apt to define as pristine or ancient now, uh, more often than not, are actually much more recent compositions. We also know that most of our fauna likely migrated to New Zealand by transoceanic dispersal, the last few million years. So most of our biota is not representative of Gondwana. Many of our more common species, our silver eyes, our fantails, our white-faced herons and so on and so forth, colonised the country only within the last few hundreds 
or few thousands of years. Now, all of this uh, naturally doesn't give us the license to promote further deliberate changes, but it should remind us, at the very least, that the changes that we have wrought actually aren't unprecedented. New Zealand's environment has been characterised probably, as I say, more than many other places in the world uh, by rapid and often violent upheavals. Keeping on with the notion, then, that the country was ecologically perfect, balanced and especially stable before people came along is in many respects not very accurate and not very helpful. And from a social perspective, educating people that our environment was perfect before they came along and that the only way that they can help is, try to, make it, is to try to make it more like it was uh, before they arrived is also, in my and many others' view, a really misguided and misanthropic strategy in the long term. Okay, number five, uh, keep going. You know, keep going. Uh, we're almost there. Roll up your sleeves. Um, don't think about this stuff too much. We still very often retain this belief uh, that we can put the bits of the fallen Humpty Dumpty back together again and that we can restore uh, what's been lost. Nature in this respect is still uh, often presented as this relatively static puzzle that's waiting for, for us to just make it whole again. Unfortunately, what the science of the last 30 to 40 years has shown is that on most levels, ecosystems really can't be restored. They are unrepeatable. More often than not, we don't even know how our, our ecosystems work today, uh, much less how they worked in the past. We do know that 95% of our species richness in New Zealand is, uh, is comprised of invertebrates, but probably at least half of those species we're yet to even classify much less figure out how they contribute to their ecosystems. We generally don't know what our baselines look like either. Most of the time our baselines are grounded in extrapolations from isolated fossil and subfossil deposits, along with some pretty rudimentary documentation of what species might have existed uh, in any particular area, in any particular time from historical records, if the aim is, is for a more recent baseline. Our baselines, to further complicate matters, are generally very poorly defined. When people talk about restoration at any particular site, it's often very vague what the baseline actually is. In my experience, if you talk to 10 different people uh, about, uh, about the baseline in any particular site, they're likely to give you uh, 10 different answers. You know, they'll, 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 one person will tell you it's pre-human, for another it'll be pre-European, somebody it'll be a restoration of function, whatever that means, or resilience, even more meaninglessly to just having more you know, native birds around, more trees or something of, of that nature, something more straightforward like that. Of course, there's nothing wrong with having different baselines, but the fact that we often aren't clear on what they are, how we can determine what they are, or what they, what they were, sorry, and even how to consistently communicate what we're trying to do is a real problem, I think. Our dreams of restoration uh, are also up against mass introductions, numerous extinctions, uh, most notably of many of our former uh, keystone species, species like moa, and constant further arrivals of spe species uh, arriving uh, both on their own uh, steam and slipping through our biosecurity system. <coughs> the overarching behemoth of climate change also floats over the top of all of this. We're irritated that introduced species don't care about our baselines, but we're also increasingly irritated that natives don't seem to care about them either. Some people might remember that you know, we used to have uh, Weka up at the, the, the sanctuary in Zealandia. Uh, those birds tended out, uh, turned out to be a real pain in the ass because they were constantly eating their native bedfellows. It was a real issue. Anyone who's tried to do wetland restoration will know that native pukeka are a similar nuisance, ripping up our attempts to plant native wetland plants. And anyone who's tried to save uh, New Zealand doctoral along our coastlines will know that they're imperiled by the constant threat of native harriers uh, eating their chicks and eggs. To the, me to the horror of many conservationists, native natives have also taken to mating with many other species, both native and introduced. Many of you will be aware that the, do that the Department of Conservation uh, have an issue with uh, native pied stilts mating with uh, endemic black stilts uh, down in Twizel and, and thus supposed supposedly sullying their respective uh, pure genotypes. Uh, we, we actually have an officer, or at least we did have an officer down there stationed with a shotgun waiting to police any of these wayward matings. <laughs> Similarly, introduced mallards have taken to mating with native grey ducks, and we used to think it was those despicable, debauched mallards behind all of this, until we came to realise that many of the matings were actually between grey duck drakes and mallard hens. So at, at times we've been forced to admit that hybridizations 
have often been the result of an appreci- a mutual appreciation for the exotic. So when we try to stop them, is this because we know better than these species themselves? We sometimes have to ask ourselves. And as uh, Chris uh, Smout, the historian that I circulated another paper to you uh, uh, recently about, noted in one of his papers, where is the loss from the perspective of the birds themselves? Another thing we know about restoration is that it's hugely expensive and time-consuming. You know, Zealandia here in, New Zealand, here in Wellington is another really great example uh, of the costs involved. The sanctuary sits literally within the wealthiest per capita population in New Zealand and also has huge local buy-in. And yet Zealandia has constantly struggled financially. It really speaks to the difficulties in making these things work long, t- long term and to the scale and scope of any initiative if it genuinely wishes to be sustainable. And lastly, we hold out hope for the silver bullet, you know, that perfect new technology that, we'll, that we're, we're constantly reminded is just around the corner and that will assuredly wipe out all these pests for good uh, at some time very soon. It's an important part of the government's recent uh, predator-free New Zealand uh, endorsement and something that has been promised for decades. And you know, I don't know, maybe we will get there this time, who knows. But usually what happens with silver bullets is that they turn out to be either unconscionably risky unethical, expensive, or or all of the above. Now, none of this, again, amounts to the suggestion that we shouldn't attempt to restore ecosystems in some circumstances and in some areas. But at the least, I wonder whether we need to start pegging back our desires for restoration, better defining what our goals are, and defining circumstances where it may be more appropriate to actually not restore. Okay, number six, uh, science. Tell us what to do. Uh, Many people have this idea that we just need to to trust the scientists on this one. Science will tell us uh, what to value, and we just need to leave it up to them. Uh, Some a range of uh, comments again from the uh, Kim Hill interview. Um, The bottom one in particular, it's not about values. It's science. It's uh, what this person contends. But it's important to remember that scientists also told us what to do during the acclimatisation era as well. We'll recall that most of the acclimatisation societies around the country included scientists, among their foremost members, who were great advocates for introducing new species uh, to New Zealand. At the time, those scientists were guided by the displacement theory of Charles Lyell, someone who also had uh, enormous influence on Darwin. Lyell taught that superior European species would inevitably displace and supplant (coughs) inferior natives, and that there was not much that could be done about it. Uh, The best that scientists at the time hoped to do was to shoot and preserve stuffed specimens of native species, Uh, for posterity, something that people like Walter uh, Buller were were made famous for. But by the latter part of the 19th century, Lyle's views uh, began to to lose popularity, uh, along with uh, the the scientific community and the space in general. And their views began to shift alongside more popular views uh, towards the appreciation that for many native species, uh, they were actually doing just fine and more of the, uh, some of the more vulnerable ones could also be protected if suitable management regimes were put in, in, in place to protect them or their habitats in the same way that we'd protect, we had protected up until that point introduced species. At the least, this sort of history provides a pause for thought that scientists A, don't always get it right, and B, change their views over time, often in line with changing uh, social and cultural values. Now, uh, restoration ecology as a science uh, emerged as a sub-discipline uh, only very recently, only in the 1980s, and it's based both on the technical idea and on the moral assumption that ecosystems can and often should be returned uh, to some prior state. Restoration ecology and related disciplines of conservation and invasion biology have had enormous influence over the environmental movement in general, to the extent that they've often uh, formed the sole voice in our discussions about wildlife and how we think it should be. The International Society for Ecological Restoration was founded in 1987, uh, and recognising the enormous impacts that humans have had on their environments, the the society remains, and this is uh, from their mission statement, it remains dedicated to reversing this degradation and restoring the Earth's ecological balance for the benefit of humans and for nature. In this way, restoration ecologists are wedded to three value-based assumptions about ecology. Firstly, that change um, is reversible, something that I've already noted is on most levels uh, extremely hard to accept, 
Secondly, that the earth has an ecological balance to which, to which it can be returned, something, again, that I've already argued is an anachronism. And lastly, that humans are distinct from nature, uh, which is also something that's really deeply questionable as well. You know, not, not everyone agrees with Tom Cruise that we came down from outer space, and Maori, most notably, have long accepted that people are a part of nature. I think most Pākehā in New Zealand, too, uh, accept this. We're, all, we're increasingly accepting of the interrelationships between people and the environments in which we live. I think we can also increasingly see that the division between nature and culture, this sort of construction, has in many ways been the problem that has gotten us into so much of this environmental strife in the first place. Now, in, a, in ecologists' defence, uh, there's no doubt that they are very, very good at some things. They're very good at collecting data and assembling graphs. What they're not so good at, and what they're not really trained for, is interrogating the ethical assumptions that underpin their science. And as you can see here, some of the most fundamental underpinnings of their science are highly debatable. That's one reason why I think it's important to try to get more, uh, more perspectives into this space now. Given that conservation is, in many respects, all about values, we need more people that have skills in this area now, particularly uh, in the humanities and the arts and the social science sciences, uh, you know, I've talked about it across geography and, and so on and so forth. By the way, I recently learnt that the Society for Ecological's mission statement has in fact uh, changed um, over the last uh, couple of years. This is, this is back in 2005 when I published my PhD. Um, somewhere um, between uh, then and now, it's, it's um, had a, an amendment. Uh, what they actually did was they s s scratched out ecological balance, which was evidently too embarrassing to leave in there anymore. So I take it from that that uh, despite what some restoration ecologists tell us, some human-induced changes can, in fact, be positive. And the society, as you can now see, at least accepts that the evolution of their mission statement is necessary, if nothing else. OK, number seven. Uh, this is this idea that we're going to end up with a monoculture. Uh, people, in general, are terrified that we're going to end up with a small number of cosmopolitan species or, or low diversity that we're just going to end up with rats and zebra mussels and brown tree snakes and, and things like that, that we're going to lose our local and regional distinctiveness and, and that a lot of this is going to be precipitated through uh, the influence of introductions. Well, you know, maybe that's, that is the case. Maybe that will come to pass. But in New Zealand, what we, can, what, we, what we can say is that we've introduced tens of thousands of species. Among plants, something over 26,000 species, nearly 30 different species of mammals, over 30 birds, tens of freshwater fish, and really hundreds, if not thousands, of, of invertebrates. We really don't even know in that space. These additions have not led to corresponding extinctions, and most of the extinctions that have occurred have been due to, this is historically, have been due to over-harvesting and to habitat loss. It's not to say that competition and predation aren't important factors today. They absolutely are. But simply to stress that these are often factors in association uh, with a range of others as well. And it's fair to say that our ecological understandings of what happens when you introduce species in general have changed too. We used to think that highly diverse ecosystems were able to repel uh, invaders. We had that idea that if the ecosystem is very diverse, uh, nothing else will be able to fit in and will protect itself from invasion. What we now know, is, uh, however, is that highly uh, diverse native ecosystems also tend to have high numbers of introduced species. So diversity itself seems to um, provide no protection against change, and more diverse ecosystems seem to pr promote ever more diversity. This is all not to say that diversity is necessarily a good thing, though, though remember. Many native ecosystems, for example, have comparatively low levels of diversity. Native beech forest and something like a Raupo wetland, for example, are, are, are good cases in point. The very idea that diversity is necessarily good is, of course, another value judgment. What we can say, however, is that species richness has increased on a local, regional and national level uh, due to introductions, both in New Zealand and elsewhere around the, around the world. Global species richness has declined, sure enough. But as British ecolo ecologist Thomas, uh, Chris Thomas sorry, recently noted, we don't yet know uh, if that may come to be counterbalanced to some extent by the evolution of new genes, varieties and species. And studies in recent times of rapid evolution in human-influenced environments seem to show that speciation, whether through divergence, hybridization, or other mechanisms, may be happening much faster than we once thought. 
Number eight. Uh, some people take it even further and say that our ecosystems are going to collapse altogether under the weight of these introductions, that our ecosystems are essentially going to all die. It's something that we've heard for many years now, particularly in the context of forest ecosystems, that, will, that these will surely um, collapse at some uh, not-too-distant point in the future and that we'll end up with deserts or savannas or something like that. Uh, the, the Parliamentary Commissioner uh, recently bought into this sort of idea, writing recently that possums, rats and stoats uh, are bent on destroying our native forests. They said that we cannot allow our forests uh, to die. So pretty, pretty scary stuff, that. But is it really happening? Um, I would say that it's not really, and it's not likely to happen any time uh, soon either. What is likely to happen is that our, e uh, our ecosystems are going to change a far less catastrophic outcome. Possum herbivory, for example, will not cause forests to collapse. What will happen is their species composition will likely change over time. Tree species that are more palatable to possums and to other herbivores will become less numerous in the canopy over time, and those that are less palatable will become more numerous. Most of the species that we suspect of precipitating collapse, remember, have been in our forest for well over 100 years now, and yet, sorry, but almost everywhere you look in these spaces, it's just wall-to-wall -wall forest. I think what's actually going to happen is that our forest ecosystems will continue to change, and their species compositions will change, as they always have in response to new arrivals and novel influences. Now, the concept of novel ecosystems was introduced to the ecological literature in the mid-noughties, just for these sorts of reasons, to speak to the fact that ecosystems around the world have changed, and continue to change, both in response to introduced species and to a range of other factors. But that these ecosystems are generally still hugely vital, prosperous and valuable as well. Ecologist Richard Hobbs and colleagues uh, had this to say about novel ecosystems back in 2009 <coughs> and what it might, might mean for some of our thinking moving forward. He wrote that cultural norms of, of nature, conservation and restoration will evolve alongside changing ecosystems. And it's likely that our present beliefs require significant adjustment. Retaining the somewhat static view of ecosystems as particular assemblages in particular places will become increasingly unrealistic. It's likely to shackle conservation and restoration efforts to ever more unrealistic expectations and objectives. It's important to remember that most of the ecosystem services that are provided by pristine ecosystems can be provided by novel ecosystems. So it's not some harsh choice between purity or obliteration here. And of, of course it can easily be argued that all of our ecosystems, uh, here in New Zealand in particular, are novel in some way, shape or form. None of them are static or uninfluenced by humans. The Ecological Society of, of America, uh, which is easily uh, the, the most influential ecological society in the world, recently recognised <coughs> these changing perspectives and what uh, sort of talk around novel ecosystems uh, is doing last year when they themed their entire conference around the concept of novel ecosystems. In sharp contrast, I suggested to the, organizations, the organizers of last year's New Zealand Ecological Society conference that we at least include a symposium on novel ecosystems in our program this year, but was essentially rebuffed and told that the notion of novel ecosystems was not seen as interesting to New Zealand ecologists. Our ecologists uh, are still uh, apparently on the restoration buzz from the 1980s, Frankly, I think we've got some real catching up to do in this space. Number nine, uh, it's this idea that we, that we simply have to do it. This idea that we either do something uh, in terms of uh, getting rid of stuff that we don't like so that something that we do uh, will survive uh, or you know, uh, very negative uh, consequences will come about. It's a, it's a sort of a position that I, f I refer to as conservation at the barrel of a gun. <coughs> A collection of quotes again here from uh, feedback to the, that Kim Hill interview. Uh, the last one being most notably um, from one of New Zealand's foremost uh, conservation biologists. And he wrote that the choice is simple. We save our most distinctive and valued species or we feed them to rats, stoats, etc. It's just this very brutal either or dichotomy. But is it really that simple? Uh, I really don't think it is actually. We can actually preserve most of our iconic species in much smaller areas than they used to inhabit, as we have very successfully shown in many offshore islands and mainland sanctuary settings. I do also re recognise the retort to that, however, which is that we're not, we're not going to be able to keep all of our biodiversity uh, as we did 800 years ago. 
And this is really a point uh, to which I have to agree, actually. Um, you know, sure, we probably aren't going to be able to keep everything as it was in the past. And yes, this is probably going to involve um, some level of extinctions. But I think we also need to be talking about the notion of extinction and what that actually means today. Because while extinction is a really dirty word in conservation, it's also, as we all know, a very important part of evolution. Paleontologists, uh, of course, remind us that most of the species that have ever lived are now extinct. So extinction is in many ways just a fact of life. But people take issue with extinction, I'm told, not just uh, with extinction itself, uh, but with human-induced extinction, with faster rates than the, the background rate, uh, whatever that is. So it's fund fundamentally about our unease with causing it rather than the, than the notion of extinction itself. And you know maybe that's understandable, but in order for ecosystems to adapt to change conditions, there needs to be a degree of extinction on many levels, whether it's, whether it's genes, varieties, species, or ecosystems. The very notion uh, that humanity could change and expand on such unprecedented levels, but that a human-exclusive nature itself could concurrently remain static, <laughs> or even relatively static, reflects the potential naivety in restoration thinking. Further, the notion that the rate of change in nature can be agreeably manipulated when necessary by humans also hints at a kind of arrogance on our part. You know, maybe our ecosystems are going to need to change now. And yes, maybe that change is going to involve some extinctions. Maybe as we come to realise uh, how little uh, of our ecosystems are completely within our control, we may have to become clearer about which species we're stay saving and why those species. Most of our conservation work in New Zealand, for example, involves saving native birds, and yet they're probably one of the more minor components of our biodiversity. At present, we're often just blindly pushing on under the understanding that we need to save everything and keep everything as it was in the past. It's like we have this big sign up all the time that just reads, you know, no extinctions allowed. You know, change, sure, sure, we'll allow change, but extinction, no, no, extinction is unacceptable. I think there seems to be too little self-reflection there, both on our enormous technical limitations and on the fact that some degree of extinction is in many ways now necessary for our ecosystems to adapt to the change conditions that we've brought about. And finally, uh, it's this idea that winners never quit. You know, a lot of people who advocate for novel ecosystems and for new approaches in ecology and our understandings of nature uh, and then in the environment in, in general are labelled as defeatist. Uh, we're called losers, we're quitters, we've given up. But again, the very notion of defeatism shows just how one-sided the conversation has been to date. A lot of people really do have the belief that there's only one way of seeing in the space and that it would be unacceptable to consider different views. You often have this quite conceited assertion from New Zealand ecologists in particular that we'd have to be ignorant to think differently about many species or ecosystems, something that I, I personally find really remarkable. Now, the science uh, writer Emma Maris, who I understand some of you are already familiar with, wrote a very good article for the journal Nature um, back in 2009 uh, on the values of novel ecosystems. And she interviewed a, a young PhD student at the time, Joe Mascaro, who was studying novel ecosystems in the, in the forests of Hawaii at the time. And she wrote that, um, and, she, and I quote her here, Standing in his Hawaiian forest, Mascaro is all too aware of change. It's something he values, even if humans did have a hand in the process. He never swore allegiance to preserving ecosystems as they were before humans arrived, as many conservationists of an older generation did. And she quoted him here as saying, people come up to me and they say, it sounds like you've given up. To which Mascara responds, I want to say I never took up arms, my man. This isn't about conceding defeat. It's about a new approach. And that approach... Uh, I would add, is informed not only by an affection and respect for native species, but also for the thousands of species that we've introduced and that we also have a responsibility for uh, in this country. It's an approach that's informed by a genuine appreciation that the environment in New Zealand has fundamentally changed since people arrived and will not be restored now. And these are some photos uh, from around the world of novel ecosystems, by the way. Um, look, New Zealand's biodiversity is going to keep changing. Uh, but not all of those changes are necessarily bad. We don't have to look at people um, necessarily as the bad guys all the time. We have this incredible diversity of life in New Zealand that's been derived, much like our human communities, from all around the world. All of our ecosystems, whether native or novel, are completely unique, and all of the species within them 
both native and introduced, have fantastic ecological and social histories that deserve to be celebrated. I put it to you that some of the ways that we understand our environment in New Zealand don't serve us that well anymore. Many of our attitudes toward wildlife now come across as excessively blinkered, old-fashioned and inaccurate. That's why I think we need to start thinking a whole lot less about how wildlife was in the past and a whole lot more about how it could be in the future. Because for me, that future is going to be diverse, it's going to be vibrant, and it's going to be full of novelty and surprise. It's going to be char characterised by constant change, reassembly and reinvigoration. Ultimately, I, I see it as the Australian historian uh, Eric Rolls saw it uh, back in 1981, which is incidentally the, the year of my birth, uh, as feral, mongrel, hybrid nature, nature stirred up, nature actually enlivened by our human presence and influences. I just wanted to uh, end now on a couple of final uh, reflections uh, and thoughts. Uh, firstly, what I want to do is implore you, uh, really as the next generation of ecologists, you could say, to think a little more critically about some of the assumptions of your disciplines. Don't just blindly swallow the positions of your, of your older colleagues, uh, including me, although I'd ask you to be a little bit more uh, sensitive towards my views. Uh, restoration in ecology in particular was developed and propagated mostly by baby boomers, who often still hold very dearly to it and the assumptions that underpin it. But there's an old saying that goes that uh, something along the lines of science progresses one funeral at a time. And as the boomers head into senescence over the next few decades, this discussion in this space is likely to ramp up. And I'd implore you during this time not to nail your colours to the mast of this older generation, but instead to keep your mind open to possibilities. Uh, in saying all of that, you also need to be careful about how you do it. Um, you probably need to be a lot more careful than I am, for example. Uh, it is, after all, a very uh, small industry that we have. And sometimes if you don't express the views of your employers, of politicians, and sometimes even of the majority of your, of your colleagues and your peers, you do put yourself in the line of fire very, very quickly. Um, people like, uh, like these, for example, take this stuff uh, very, very seriously. They take it very personally, and they're not afraid to come after you personally if you contradict them as well. So you do, at the end of the day, have to be careful about how you talk about the birds and the bees. And whether that's right or whether that makes sense uh, is sometimes beyond the point. So to end um, on a more playful note now, and um, because no one uh, can stop talking about this guy, and I, I thought I'd conclude with a, with a little Trump analogy of my own. Um, and this is partly because I've been accused myself uh, recently of displaying a couple of Trump-like qualities. Um, <laughs> So I've noticed that Trump, uh, for a lot of people, has kind of become the new Hitler. And, you know, if you want to discredit someone, you basically just point uh, to any characteristic you see as, as vaguely Trump-like. Uh, it's a very easy strategy, of course, because Trump's views are so varied and often contradictory that we all essentially have a little bit of Trump in us. So uh, some people, for example, have said that uh, my research is just an attempt to, to get attention, uh, that I'm just um, up here grandstanding uh, and trying to get on TV or something, just like Trump, they might say. Uh, and it came up, actually, uh, in, in my, uh, my interview uh, with Kim Hill. Um, Kim asked me at, some, at one point, she said something like, you know, Jamie, is this, is this just an, an attempt to get attention? And I responded with something like, you know, there, there are easier ways to get attention than, you know, spending years of your life uh, writing a PhD uh, thesis, much easier ways. Uh, again, this one, again, really usefully illustrates the attitude out there, um, that there can only be one way to think about nature and the environment, and that if you think differently, you must be crazy, or you must be ignorant, or you must be just wanting to get attention, of course. The other Trump accusation that's been levelled at me is that I'm some sort of post-truth post uh, advocate, denying what are taken to be the obvious facts about how we must value our environments and how we must think about the concept of nature. Of course, for some people, uh, all of these facts about how we should value nature were carved in slate by baby boomers in the 1970s and 80s, and woe betide anyone who questions boomer wisdom. Again, it's another example of the real absence of critical reflection on the value-laden assumptions of ecology and the environment. But, uh, seeing as we're doing this exercise, um, how about we just turn it around for a minute? Let's think for a moment, for, just for argument's sake, uh, whether there are any similarities between Donald Trump uh, and mainstream conservationists. So let's put Trump's head in there, um, and we'll maybe make that a rat, seeing as he's strangling the rat. Um, 
we'll add some appropriately nationalistic slogan in there as well. Um, and just to complete the picture, we'll, we'll make that a Mexican rap. Um, so uh, if, we, if we move forward from here, what are some similarities between Trump uh, or Trump supporters and your average mainstream conservationist? Well, uh, firstly, uh, demographics. Trump supporters are not unlike your typical uh, conservationists. They're generally white, <coughs> middle class, uh, male dominated. Looking around this room, uh, it's a very white audience. It's not that dissimilar for most forest and bird audiences, uh, most ecological society audiences. How about whether there are any similarities between the, the two groups' overall vision? Well, Trump's vision is that the world, of course, was better in the past. For him, that, that, that great time was probably in the 1950s and the 1960s, which incidentally was a time when black people couldn't eat at the same restaurant as white people, when women were discouraged from working, when animal welfare was virtually non-existent, you know, and so on and so forth. But white guys found it pretty easy to, to get a job, so it wasn't all bad, right? Conservationists, for their part, also think that life was better in the past. They just tend to take, take it a step further in the sense that they think that life was better before they existed. Okay, and thirdly, who's to blame? Who's responsible for our troubles? Well, for Trump, naturally, it is foreigners, it's immigrants. Not all immigrants, mind you. The useful kinds are okay. The ones that pick your fruit, that wash your clothes, take your kids to school, these ones are all fine. It's the illegal immigrants for Trump that are the real problem, the criminal gangs and what the murderers, the rapists, the terrorists. And mainstream conservationists, well, they also tend to think that foreigners are to blame. Again, not all of them. The useful ones are okay, the sheep, the kiwi fruit, the cabbages, the honeybees. These are all useful things. These things are okay. It's the ones that make a menace of themselves, the ones that forget their place, the weeds and pests. These are the ones that need to go. And finally, the solution to the problem. Here again, Trump and conservationists are in broad agreement. For both parties, the solution is to get rid of these foreigners, to send them back where they came from, <coughs> Australia, Asia, Mexico, wherever the hell they came from. Who knows? Who cares? They just need to go because they're causing problems for the locals. And if we can't do that, if we can't get rid of them entirely, we're of course going to have to build a wall. A wall to keep the good and rightful natives on the one side and the exotic scum on the other. And as you can see with this uh, very scientific montage that I now have brought up, uh, all in all it's a very uh, nasty situation that's just crying out from a, for a hero, uh, I won't say who, uh, to swoop down and save the day. Uh, but it's going to take all of his superpowers uh, to save us from these wicked villains um, and their diabolical um, schemes. But, you know, seriously though, um, this kind of bullshit uh, is exactly, exactly the kind of stuff that we really need to be getting away from. Because discussions around people's ideas about nature and the environment and how we should think about it and manage it are always going to be complex. You're always going to have different parties discussing these things from different perspectives and through different lenses. And for me, this isn't a debate about good guys and bad guys. And similarly, it shouldn't be seen as a debate between good species and bad species. Almost everyone who's working and thinking in the environmental space has good intentions, and we probably all agree on more things than we disagree on. But we have slightly different visions for the future and what our, our ideal environment looks like and how we should get there, or whether we should even get there. To my mind, there is no categorically right way to think about nature and the environment, and anyone who tells you there is is patently overreaching. If we're going to progress our collective understandings of how best to value and manage our environments, we need to keep these, those communication lines open and stop resorting to these militant and often unproductive polarities. So that, that basically concludes my, my talk now. And I just want to mention a couple of things that are coming up over the next few months. Uh, firstly, um, I'll be going along to the Crazy Ambitious Conference, uh, which is uh, held next month uh, at Papa here in Wellington. In case you hadn't noticed, that's essentially a predator-free New Zealand conference. And I'll be speaking on one of the, the, the panel discussions there about the merits, uh, and probably in my case, demerits of Predator Free. I encourage you to come along and, and listen to that and um, you know, contribute to that sort, of, that sort of conference and listen to the other uh, presentations there. I'll also be giving a, a talk uh, here at Vic uh, in June to the School of Biological Sciences. I'm not sure what exactly I'll be talking about um, then, but uh, it will be thought-provoking, I hope.
Uh, and finally, I want to say that uh, I'm now working, I'm not working, but I'm now uh, a regular con a contributor to SciBlogs. Uh, a lot of you all know SciBlogs. It's a sort of uh, platform for uh, scientists to communicate with the public and other scientists uh, through, through blogs, uh, you know, meaning that I'll be posting more regular um, for, uh, thoughts in that forum. Uh, if you get a chance, I'd really encourage you to read the odd post in there, maybe offer some comments and you know, uh, test me out a little. I'd really appreciate that. Uh, as you can imagine, I do enjoy a bit of uh, spirited back and forth. So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much for listening.